This is KGW News at Noon. I'm Brenda Braxton. Thank you for joining us today. You know, we had a rare quiet night in Portland, even as protests for racial justice continue. Two smaller groups gathered yesterday evening, one at the Justice Center, the other at Alberta Park in Northeast Portland. But we saw no acts of violence or any clashes with police. The calm comes as city leaders, including the mayor, are condemning Monday night's riot in the Pearl District. Police made 19 arrests as protesters lit fires, including one inside the mayor's condominium building. Officers are facing scrutiny of their own after one was caught on camera chasing down a protester and punching the man. Our Mike Benner has more. This was the scene at Northwest 10th and Gleason Monday night. Hundreds of protesters occupying the streets outside the building where Mayor Ted Wheeler lives. Demonstrators started several fires, one of them inside a dental office in the base of the building. They actually tried to set fire inside uh, in, the, in the deep space of the clinic. And that, in a high-rise building, that's completely uncalled for. That could have uh, gotten out of hand and it could have really led to something pretty serious. Neighbors echo that sentiment. This no longer has anything whatsoever to do with Black Lives Matter, and that's the tragedy of this. As police dispersed the large crowd Monday night, cameras captured one officer tackling and punching a protester. We're told this is now under review. In the meantime, Mayor Wheeler turned to Facebook to share his thoughts on what the officer did and what protesters did. The mayor says these acts range from stupid to dangerous to criminal. The violence must stop. None of this should sit well with any thinking Portlander. Portland's police chief Chuck Lavelle is also weighing in, not on what cameras captured his officer doing, but instead on what happened outside Mayor Wheeler's condo building. The chief says last night marked yet another escalation of the senseless violence. The families that live inside have done absolutely nothing to provoke a threat to their lives. Only time will tell if the statements from these city leaders make the slightest bit of difference moving forward. In Portland, Mike Benner for KGW News. Mayor Wheeler says he's moving out of his condo after that riot in the Pearl. He sent his neighbors an email, and one resident shared it with us here at KGW. It reads in part, I want to express my sincere apologies for the damage to our home and the fear that you are experiencing due to my position. It's unfair to all of you who have no role in politics or in my administration. He went on to say, as much as I have enjoyed living in our building and being your neighbor, it is best for me and for everyone else's safety and peace that I move. We're also tracking the latest on the deadly shooting in Portland as supporters of the president clashed with counter protesters downtown. No one's been arrested for the crime yet. However, the Oregonian newspaper quotes police sources as saying they are investigating a man named Michael Reinald. He reportedly identifies as an anti-fascist and has a history of recent protests here in Portland. Now, this is a picture of him from an interview that he did with Bloomberg. He was arrested in early July on charges of resisting arrest and carrying a gun during a protest. Court records show those charges were later dropped. The Oregonian also reports Reinald was shot in the arm in late July, trying to wrestle a gun away from someone during a scuffle in downtown Portland. Governor Brown is sending Oregon state troopers to help Portland police respond to the protests. U.S. Marshals have deputized these troopers who've been specially selected for this assignment. Our Pat Doris explains how this new move is a game changer. This is basically the ground changing under the feet of the protesters because when the state police come in and they are cross deputized by the U.S. Marshal's office, suddenly they're able to make arrests under the federal laws. And I'm told that there is something similar to interfering with a police officer under the federal law. The district attorney will not prosecute someone for that charge, but the U.S. Attorney's Office has been much more aggressive at holding people accountable and in prosecuting for all kinds of charges. And so I think you're going to see a lot more of that start to happen. 
happen as soon as these officers arrive. I think that the public is going to take it differently because instead of having this um, perception that President Trump is sending in a whole cadre of federal agents that are going to take over the city and teach those Democrats how to do things right, instead these are the people that have grown up here that are state police officers all over the state. People know them. People generally have a very high respect for the state police, but they're also going to have these federal powers. They're not just going to stay at the federal courthouse, by the way. They'll probably be all over the city wherever the protests are. That was Pat Doris reporting. Now, we reached out to the DA's office today. A spokesperson referred us to a statement earlier this week that said, we continue to prioritize public safety resources in Multnomah County by focusing on the violent crimes occurring at protests and in our community, including the recent and alarming increase in gun violence this summer. Well, the search for a coronavirus vaccine is moving forward. AstraZeneca has started phase three clinical testing. It's the third vaccine to reach large scale clinical trials here in the United States. At the same time, the FDA said it may approve a vaccine for emergency use even before those big human trials are finished. There's a lot to keep track of. So Brittany Falkers talked to NBC's senior medical correspondent. Here's how Dr. John Torres broke it down for us. Phase three are large human trials, in some cases 30,000 people, that mimic society, mimic the population. So they're gonna have a variety of ages, usually 18 to 65 plus, some even say up to 99, a variety of medical conditions, including pre-existing conditions that can put them at a, a, at a situation where they might have complications from coronavirus and a variety of ethnicities. This is really interesting now. The FDA commissioner has said that the agency may grant emergency use authorization to a vaccine before it completes large scale human trials. So how would they determine is it safe to do so? Usually what they do is they do an approval. The approval process takes years. On the average for vaccine, 11 years to get that approval. But when now because of an emergency, they'll do this emergency use authorization. In this case, what they're saying is they're gonna go ahead and look at the benefits versus the risk. If the benefits outweigh the risk, because we know the risk of coronavirus right now, then they're gonna go ahead and approve it. They typically wait until they're through phase three. That's gonna take some time. And what Dr. Hahn with the FDA is saying, we might be able to look at it before phase three is done and for certain groups of, pop of people for certain populations, including frontline healthcare workers, the elderly, those with pre existing conditions that are going to put them at a higher risk of complications. Some worry politics is behind the push to authorize a vaccine for emergency use, but FDA Commissioner Dr. Stephen Hahn insists he would not rush the process just to please the president. So if a vaccine is approved, who would get it first? A newly released plan answers that question. The vaccine would be distributed in four phases, according to a committee formed by the National Institutes of Health and the CDC. Healthcare workers, first responders, and people at highest risk are the top priority. Phase two would be teachers, essential workers, older adults not included in phase one, and people in homeless shelters, in prisons, in jails and detention centers. Young adults and children make up the third phase. And finally, everyone else not vaccinated yet would be in phase four. Right now, we wanna check on the White River fire, give you an update on that. It's burning more than 16,000 acres today, and it's growing. Highway 216 is back open, but fire crews are working right along the road, so drivers should be careful. The fire is still 10% contained today, and the sheriff's office is warning people they could be ordered to evacuate at any time if the fire kicks up again. 